Hey church, my name is Jamie Bell, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Hope Chapel Downtown Location Pastor. You know, we're inching closer and closer to our fall launch in September, and though that seems so far away, God is actively working right now. We've just recently launched our community group this year and it's growing and we're making connections every single week as people are finding out about what God's doing and what he's leading us to do and they're wanting to be a part. We're getting ready to launch Alpha downtown in May and then we're gonna be having worship nights in June, July and August. And then we got coming up at the end of April, on April 20th, we're actually gonna be taking some time to pray for our city. And not only are we gonna be praying for our city, but they're actually having a city cleanup day. And I would just love anybody that's interested and that would love to be a part to come and join me. It's amazing. They're actually starting the cleanup day right outside of my apartment. So let's come together. Let's bring hope downtown and let's have an opportunity helping people experience real life in Jesus Christ. I would love for you to join me. I'd love for you to find out about what's going on downtown and partner with us in any way that you possibly can. To find out that information, register for that event, or find out anything else about what's going on downtown, visit hopechapel.com backslash downtown to find out any of that information. Thank you so much for letting me share about some stuff that's going on downtown. Now let's jump into our new sermon series, Jesus Stuff. I think, I think I just heard Jamie ask everybody to go clean up outside of his apartment. Is that what I heard? Maybe next week we could talk about cleaning up my neighborhood and my HOA would get involved and so, never mind. It's a, it's a really great thing that's going on downtown. And as you can tell, there's already some momentum. Jamie's telling me about people connecting both from other locations in Hope Chapel that live downtown. We've, we've got a couple people that live in the Northland that have been coming to Olathe. How many of you would agree it's a good thing we got a downtown location that's coming for people like that? Isn't that awesome? On top of that, we've got people who are coming who are not affiliated with our church, and they're just walking in the the doors of this group for the first time trying to figure out what they think about Jesus, and we think that's pretty cool as well. So there's a lot of good things happening with downtown. Uh, If we haven't met before, my name is Jake. I have the privilege of pastoring here at the church. Last Sunday was kind of a big deal for us. It was called Easter, and we had such a wonderful celebration. I want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who served in meaningful ways, whether you were part of the choir last week, or you were in the egg factory last week, or you were making coffee, or part of the music team, or serving our kids, or part of any one of those teams. I want to say thank you, and a special thank you to everyone who came at 9 a.m., because at 11, we had parking problems. So for all of you who came at 9 a.m., thank you for coming at 9 a.m. Continue to come at 9 a.m. It's a great service. We want you here at 9 a.m. All that said, we are starting a brand new series today called Jesus Stuff, where we're talking about what it means to live this thing out that we call Christianity. We think Jesus is kind of a big deal, and maybe the best part about Easter last week was watching all these people get connected to Jesus for the first time, or maybe for the first time in a long time. We talk about Jesus every week in our church. We think it's a really big deal to not only get connected, but follow in his way as well. And this series is going to be a little bit like a praxis approach, which means we want to take the theory of what we see in Jesus, the teachings, the scriptures, and we want to see how it becomes practice. All over the world, in a number of settings, the goal of education is practice. We want to live out the things that we're learning all about. And the same is true when it comes to our faith, if you think about it. We want to learn about the Good Samaritan so we can go practice being a good neighbor to somebody else. We want to learn the principles of generosity so we can be generous in every way. We want to learn about what it means to pray for the sick so that we can go pray for the sick and they can be made well. We actually are crazy enough to believe that this stuff isn't just good principles like another set of Aesop's fables, but we really believe that the life-changing power of Jesus is not just for 2,000 years ago, but for today as well. 
There are a lot of people out there that are going to show up to churches today and they're hoping that their kids are going to be taught good morals and they're going to come in and learn a a few good tools to help them in aiding them in the thing that they really want to do with their life. But we want to be a church that not only surrenders our lives to Jesus and gets in alignment with what he says about our lives, but believe that through the power of his Holy Spirit, he's going to work in and through us in situations as well. That's the sort of church I want to be a part of, that our leaders and pastors want to be a part of, and so many of you have said, I long to be a part of as well. Now, what we want to do through this series then is begin to figure out how do we live this out in practice. In, in, in practice. I, I'll be honest with you, like a lot of different methodologies around education function exactly the same way, both in the ancient world and in the modern world. Like if you were at the time of Jesus and you were a little Jewish boy going to school for the first time in ancient synagogue school, then you would have gone to something called Bet Sefer, which means house of learning. And as a young child, you'd be memorizing the laws of Moses. As the Torah gets deeper and deeper inside of you, you would move on to to other elements like Bet Midrash and Bet Talmud. Bet Midrash is this idea of house of exploration or investigation. It's the idea of studying all the things that you've learned. And Bet Talmud is about moving to a place where you now follow after a rabbi. And you begin to to not only study the scriptures and memorize the scriptures, but begin to live the scriptures out. Not just by following what they say, but by watching them model what it means to be a God-fearing individual. In the West, we've had something for the last 500 years in one way, shape, or form called the classical education model. And this starts with grammar. It's the same idea of memorization. That young children, as their brains are fresh, begin to memorize facts and figures, getting it deep inside of them. And as they get a little older, they move to logic. Logic is the study and the exploration of all the things they've been memorizing. And then they finish with rhetoric, which is where they debate these ideas one to another and then begin to live them out in practice. And then Jesus, who's our model, does almost the same thing. He takes people who have been memorizing an ancient Jewish school. They've been studying, and as they begin to follow him, he gathers them together, and then he grows them into big people, and then he sends them out. He tells them to go into all the world. And so we would say that the process and the posture of following Jesus has never changed for 2,000 years. It hasn't changed through Jewish school, and it hasn't changed here in the West for the last 500 years. That there is a process of learning and digesting content, studying it and understanding it, and then going and living it out. Which means that if your faith only stops at the pages of scripture, then you have never moved to the place of full graduation of what it means to truly follow after Jesus. There are a lot of people out there that are interested in memorizing the text, in studying the text, but when it comes to living it, there's a massive disconnect. We, we would say this, we would say that Jesus' invitation was never to be a spectator, but to be a follower. And so I want to encourage you in the same way. This this is how many people come into a relationship with Jesus. Like either through the head or through the heart or through some action, they're engaged with Jesus for the first time. But at some point in time, something translates deep inside of their heart. They have not just a, a teaching and a learning, but a revelation that takes shape in their lives. I've, I've sat with people before who have sat in church for weeks, months, and even years, sometimes even decades, and, and their lives have not been transformed. And then one particular Sunday morning or coffee appointment, something happens on the inside and everything changes. And now they want to read their Bible, and now they want to pray, and now they want to engage because something, some revelation is kicked off on the inside of them. And when that happens, there begins this hunger for learning. And so I'm going to encourage us in the same way, hunger to memorize the scripture. Live what we might call a red letter life. Back in the 1800s, there was a a news editor who said, I want to write an article about Jesus and I want everybody to know the words of Jesus in the middle of my article. So he turned them all red and now we have red letter Bibles today. Many of you, you, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see, why are some of the letters in red? Those are the words 
words of Jesus. So I'd love for us to read and, and live a red letter life. Like look at the text of Jesus and maybe even through this series, go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and digest what Jesus is actually saying as opposed to what people say he said. And see how that doesn't shape and change. And then study it. Get into some groups. Get on the phone and, and discuss it with other people. Pray into those things. Allow those words to become rich in your life. And then begin to live it out. And let's together do the Jesus stuff. You know, like it's really hard to describe. The reason we're calling it the Jesus stuff is because how do you fully describe all that Jesus did? It's really hard. It's just kind of the stuff. But I promise you, you know it when you've seen it. When someone is extremely generous towards somebody else in gesture, in word, and in deed. When somebody steps out of their way to forgive somebody else that you would think is impossible within our own human capacity. When someone prays and lays hands and we see a change that takes place in the life. When someone goes from spiritual death to spiritual life and moving in a new direction. You know the Jesus stuff when you've seen it. And when you see it, you know people are never the same. Now, how much stuff did Jesus do? Well, John 21, verse 25 is the last verse in the book of John. And it finishes by saying Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for all the books that would have been written. In other words, he did that much stuff. He did so much stuff that John got sick of writing about it. This reminds me a little bit about like, like with all the term papers that I wrote in college and, and the, you know, they, they'd say, hey, write a 10 page paper and I'd find I'm nine and a half pages in and because I was a bit lazy, I didn't really want to finish it well. So I just kind of figured out like I need to uh, like we're about 10 pages in. Let's just finish this thing out. And I think this is how I finished a lot of my term papers like John 21. And there was a lot of other stuff that went on and I could write about it, but I'm not going to. You're just going to have to trust me. The end. And, and that's how John finished his letter. That's how he finished his letter. The next book in the closed canon that we put together is a literal book called The Acts of the Apostles. The most action-oriented book in the Bible. Literally called The Acts of the Apostles. So John's like, hey man, I'm done. But then Luke picks it up in the book of Acts and says, let me keep going. Let me tell you about all the things that the followers of Jesus went on to do. Peter and Paul and all the apostles expanding the message of Jesus all over the known world. It's incredible. I'm going to tell you all about it. This idea of Acts tells us that we are a part of an action-oriented faith. That we have never been called into a place of deep contemplative work without moving forward. Uh, Jack Hayford, of all people, he said, I love what he says. He says, Acts is a record of practicing Christianity under the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, it's about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So during this series, we're going to explore the Jesus stuff, the life he lived, the things he did. After all, he did signs and wonders, followed, gathered a following, taught the people about a coming kingdom, and literally changed the world. And I know what some of you are thinking, because I've thought it too before. As you read the pages of scripture, you can't get over the fact that there is a disconnect between the sort of life that Jesus lived and the modern world of Johnson County that you live in today. Like you read about Peter and Paul, you read about the laying out of hands and you go, why do these things not happen today? And so maybe the first place that we need to start with this series is by asking the question, are we even invited into that sort of Christianity in the 21st century? John 14, 12 is, is a problem verse. We would say John 14, 12 is a problem. And I've read it several times. Uh, theologians smarter than me and more well-versed have read it before, and they don't have all of the answers. It's been debated for 2,000 years in church history. But John 14, 12 says, Very truly, I tell you, these are the words of Jesus, so imagine they're in red letters. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father." 
Now, this is a problem verse because it's really hard for me to imagine that you and I are going to do greater things than Jesus did. As we talked about last week, he didn't raise one person from the dead or two, but three people from the dead, and then he was raised from the dead. It said that he cast out demons. Sometimes it was one, sometimes it was a whole group, sometimes it was subtle, sometimes it was really obvious. They said he confronted the devil in the wilderness and overcame by fasting for 40 days. We're, we're talking about great works that Jesus did. It's hard for me to imagine, I don't know about you, that you and I are going to do greater works than Jesus. And so the question that theologians have asked for a long time is wrapped up in this word greater. What does greater mean? What does greater mean? And listen, we live in a modern culture where everyone's concerned about greatness. Like in sports, if you care about sports at all, the question is, who is the goat in every sport? And we're not talking about the animal. We're talking about the greatest of all time for you non-sports people out there. Who is the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Is it Brady or Mahomes? Is it LeBron or Jordan? Who's the greatest of all time? Because our culture celebrates greatness. We lean into greatness. We want to know what greatness looks like. And the same is true in our faith. We want to know know what it means to be great. Good news for us, not great news, but good news, this is not the only time that Jesus talked about people or things being greater. In Matthew 11, 11, Jesus says, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, he's, he's the man. He's, he, there's nobody greater than that. But then he goes on and really messes with us and says, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than he. So he's the greatest, but then there's actually somebody greater than them, and that's the least in the kingdom. And there are two different ways to look at this text that most theologians find. There's, there's one approach where we can say, this is about a time in history. John the Baptist is the greatest at this point in history because up until this point in time, we've been waiting for the Messiah, and now he's the one who's going to announce the Messiah. So he's, he's the greatest because he, in this point in history, is bringing about a new revelation for people, helping them understand what God has come to do after hundreds of years. But then, and then the, the greatest after that is the one who's the least in the kingdom because that's somebody who's expended, extended into the future and is part of the coming kingdom. Then there's another approach that says that this is all a passage on humility, that John the Baptist was a humble guy, and also the least in the kingdom is about humility, and that's what this is about. But John 11, 11, or Matthew 11, 11 tells us that there are greater people than others. Matthew 18 goes on in verses 1 and 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus. And again, you'll see this story in Luke and also in Mark, and they're all arguing over who's the greatest. So the disciples come, and they're in a the little, little bit of an argument, and they're arguing as they come to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They're all arguing over, am I going to be greater than you? Which is, again, no different than it is today. We all think that we're going to be greater than somebody else, or we want to be. And Jesus responds by saying, if you want to be the greatest, therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we know that children are to be seen and not heard in the ancient world, that they were of a lowly status, not seen as having the same credence and credibility as maybe even they do today. Matthew 18 clearly tells us, you've got to humble yourself if you want to be the greatest. And then Matthew 23, 11 continues on by saying, the greatest among you will be your servant. So this idea of greatness, what does it mean to do greater works? Well, we know John the Baptist was the greatest, little children were the greatest, and the servant of all was the greatest. Doesn't really help us, does it? What does it mean to be great in the kingdom of heaven? I'm, I'm here to tell you, like, I, I could probably pray and send you out because I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but there are a few things that I know to be true. I know that greater things for us today starts with an acknowledgement that we have greater time today than Jesus did. Jesus lived for 33 years. Our our rate of expected, like, like our mortality rate today is more than double that. Wouldn't we agree? We have more time. Uh, Jesus ministered for three years. Jesus did not have a five-year ministry plan. There was no five-year ministry plan. He was only ministering for three years. Sometimes in the church we go, man, we just need more time, you know, or it's not godly. Jesus did not work 
on that mentality. In three years, he changed the world in a short period of time. But today, today, we have greater time. Some of you feel like you've moved backwards in life for the last 10 years. I don't know that you have moved backwards. I don't think that we're able to say because of our productivity in the world and how the world judges success that we're able to also say that we've been more successful or less successful. Jesus instead would say, are you following after me? Is your life transformed in such a way where, where you're in deeper communion with me and you're seeking to follow in my way? It's a, it's a very different mentality in the kingdom of God. But we clearly have more time. So we have more time to do greater works. On top of that, we have greater space. We have greater space. <laughs> Jesus is in the Middle East in the year like zero. There are about 300 million people on the planet at that time. Just a handful of Jews in comparison. I, I don't know, four to five million that he's ministering to. He says that my intentional ministry is to the Jewish people. But now, now the kingdom of God and all of his followers has spread out all over the world to the 8 billion plus people that are on the planet today, 2,000 years later. We've not only been given more time, but we've been given more space as well to make a profound impact. Here we are in Olathe, Kansas, in the middle of the U.S., a, a nation that was hardly discovered by the Europeans or by the Middle Eastern people so many years ago. And we're given opportunity to be able to reach a whole different tribe and group of people than we ever have before. We've been given all of this space, and on top of it, we've been given greater diversity, Diversity of cultures and experiences and locations. There are people starting all types of ministries today. There are ministries to bikers and swimmers and actors and single parents and immigrants and schools and woodworkers and elderly and athletes and children and cowboys and Native Americans and dancers and quilters and bunko and 12-step and home builders. There is greater diversity than ever before when it comes to ministry. There are literally hundreds of thousands of Christian nonprofits around the planet. We now minister in, in nearly 7,000 languages around the world. There is not only greater time and greater space, but greater diversity than ever before. And you have to imagine when Jesus is talking in John 14 about what his followers would go on to do, that the greater things he was talking about wasn't raising the dead, but it was about the greater time, the greater space, and the greater diversity. He does go on to say, how is all of this going to be done? How is this all possible? Well, he'd say in John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, otherwise known as the spirit of truth. You see, when you include God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, into this mix of more time and more space and more diversity, you know what you get? You get more possibilities. You get more possibilities. Friends, we get to be a part of seeing the Jesus stuff happen because God has given us his very spirit. It's not just for the pages of scripture, but it's for us today as well. It's the way in which we're empowered to do all these crazy ministries and to go to all these crazy places. And here's the beauty of it. It's going to look a little bit different from person to person. And the apostle Paul tells us why. He says, because for some of you, you're going to be given spiritual gifts of hospitality. And for others of you, you're going to have spiritual gifts of prophecy. And for others of you, you're going to have spiritual gifts of healing. That we're all going to have different gifts, talents, and abilities, and it's not going to look the same to everybody. And that's really hard for people because we want everybody to look the same. And when they don't look the same, we begin to get a little judgmental. Well, why don't they look like me? And they need to do it more like I do it because that's my thing. And that's just not how it works. Instead, what we understand is that God gives, through the power of his Holy Spirit, different gifts to different people. Why? 
As Ephesians 4 tells us, for the building up of the church. Because we are one body, as 1 Corinthians tells us. And when all of that comes to bear, we begin to see God's power on display. The creativity for these ministries, God's spirit. The one who transforms the lives of people, God's spirit. The one who gives us every gift under the sun, God's spirit. And when he fills us with gifts of faith, gifts of healing, gifts of evangelism, we begin to realize that everything begins to come to life. We like to say it this way, greater works are going to look different from person to person, but greater works are the Jesus stuff. That's the Jesus stuff. It means that we're going to see sacrifices and people modeling their lives and laying them down in hard places. It means that we could see signs and wonders. It means that people are going to enter into greater places of humility, patience with one another. Greater works means anything is possible and the lid has to come off. Greater works means that we're ready for how God may want to work in and through our lives. It's possible that you think I'm absolutely crazy today. In fact, it's probable that you think I'm absolutely crazy today. But it's possible that you also believe that God then can't do certain things. It's possible that there's a longing in your heart that hasn't been filled because you've pursued God yet have not fully experienced him. Throughout the years, I've I've had people say to me, Jake, you don't really believe that when you pray for people, God can do remarkable things. And they go, Yeah, actually I do. I I really do. And not only do I believe that, I've experienced it as well. I don't think that everything has to come with a crazy show attached to it. But I have seen the life-changing power of God in profound ways. And I've seen people who have longed for that and pursued that. And I've seen people who have shut the door of their heart to the idea that God may want to speak in and through them into the lives of others. And I'm just crazy enough to believe that we can be the sort of church that doesn't restrict what God can and cannot do. I told people a really long time ago, I go, I just don't want to get in the business of telling God what he can and cannot do in my life. I don't want to get in that business. And even more so, I want to be open and receptive to whatever God wants to do in my life. Wherever God wants to send me, whatever God wants to speak to me, whatever God wants to use me for, I want to be open to everything God has for my life. I wonder today for you what it means for you to be open. As we start this series called The Jesus Stuff, you have to first read the pages of scripture and see what Jesus did and then decide whether or not the invitation is for you as well to enter into this crazy sort of life that the first disciples entered into. And if it's true and you're willing to go on this journey, that you position your life in such a way to open yourself up to say, God, whatever you want to do in and through me, I'm open, but I don't want to put the lid on you. And I don't want to restrict what you can and cannot do. I don't want to get into that business. Instead, I want to be pliable. I want you to be able to draw to attention the areas of my life where maybe I'm not in alignment with you. The places of pride, the places of ego, the places of selfish ambition, the places where humility is as far away as it possibly could and draw me into your story. God, I I wanna be able to, to listen when there's somebody far from you that you may be drawing me toward to to have a coffee and to take a step of faith to encourage them in their journey of faith. God, I wanna be open to what you may wanna do with my career, what you may wanna do with my family, what you may wanna do with my finances. God, I wanna be open to how you may want to speak in and through me as, as as I sense you saying things that I have the guts to be able to say them out loud and not feel crazy all the time. Friends, let's not be people who claim to follow after Christ and then limit what he could do. Instead, be open to the idea that maybe the pages of scripture can come alive in your heart, not just in some areas, 
but in all areas as he seeks to move you fully into his image. That's what this series is about. And so here's our challenge today. Our challenge is very simply to pray a prayer, either out loud or silent at your seat, that just simply says, God, I'm open. I'm open. I'm open to what you would want to do in and through me. I'm open. You're either closed or you're open. I know some of you probably feel a little cracked. People would say that about you. But but there's an openness that comes from the invitation of your lips that says, come Holy Spirit, have your way in and through me. Speak to my life. Speak to my heart. Change my life. Allow me, allow me to never be the same. God, I, I don't want to live this sort of life wrapped up in myself, but I want you to truly get a hold of who I am, that I might be moved and shaped and redirected in a way where I am never the same. As we take some time to pray and to meditate and to respond this morning, Let's just enter in with a posture of readiness and openness that sets the table for where we go over the next several weeks. And I know it's going to be a busy season for many of us. We've got Mother's Day coming up. We've got graduations. Summer vacations are going to start. But I'm asking you, either in person or online, would you journey with us over the next few weeks together? And let's see where this road might take us and how God may transform each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Father, we want to say thank you for the privilege that it is to gather in your name. We're grateful. Father, we open our lives up to you. Forgive us if we've sought to limit what you can do. It's our belief today that with you, all things are possible. And so help us in our unbelief. Lord, I know that for some of us, this just, it makes us uncomfortable to think that you might want to invade. Yet, Lord, ultimately, if we're honest, we want to know that the stuff stuff is real. Lord, we know your plans are are good, that you're for us, not against us. And so we pray that you'd fill us fresh with your Holy Spirit today, that we might pursue you and everything that you have for us. We love you and we trust you. In Christ's name. Amen. All over this place, will you stand? As we go into a time of responsive worship, I I recognize that sometimes we can be in a room of people and the Lord will be speaking to us all very differently. So maybe you felt nudged or led to respond and, and, and you just need to kind of steal away a moment with the Lord. And so just to remind you, we have these areas up here of prayer and response. They're lit up and there's gonna be some people that are stationed there, ready and willing to pray with you, join their faith with yours if you need healing, if you need someone to pray over a situation with you. Maybe you want to write a prayer. Maybe you want to spend